Good evening, everyone, for the last Bible study for this part of 2024 before we take our summer break, June 27th, 2024, and we're going to be looking at the last part of Acts 9 tonight here at Narkey Street Congregation in Jerusalem as Peter leaves Jerusalem and travels down to the coast to Lod and Jaffa. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come to you and we put our faith in you and in your strength. And we are so grateful that we have your word, that we have these words of encouragement, these examples of faith to uh, guide us in our lives today in the 21st century. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us like what we see tonight in Acts 9 with Peter, and that you would move also in our lives in new and fresh ways. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's read Acts 9, 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, and Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the windows stood around him, sorry, all the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and he helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So tonight, we this study is really going to be focused on Peter. And in order to get the full context and the background here, I want to look at what Peter has done so far in the book of Acts. And you'll remember in Acts chapter 1, first chapter, Peter was there on the Mount of Olives after um, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he was there with all the other disciples or apostles. And they saw Jesus ascend to heaven from there. And they walked back into Jerusalem at that time. And it says, it lists all the different disciples that were there, all 11, because Judas Iscariot was dead. And they were all praying in the upper room, as it's traditionally called, along with the women, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and some of his brothers. And then it says that Peter stood up among the believers and he's the one who said, we need to pick a new disciple or apostle. Since we've lost Judas, he's died, we need to choose another one. And that's how they came up with Mattathias as the new 12th apostle. 
And so you see here in Acts 1, Peter is the first disciple mentioned, the first apostle mentioned. He's the one who's leading the proceedings in the room when they're having to make a decision about who will replace Judas. And then as we go into Acts 2, you'll recall that the day of Pentecost or Shavuot came and they were all together. Possibly they were in the temple area and it talks about the spirit coming like a wind and these tongues of fire that rested on them and they were all speaking in different tongues. And it's Peter who first speaks um, as a representative of the group to the crowds that are gathering around them as they speak in all these tongues. And he is the one who gives this first sermon, this first public sermon to the Jews who have come up to Jerusalem for the Chag, the holiday, the festival of Shavuot. And he is the one preaching Jesus crucified as Lord and Messiah. And then the people, they ask Peter specifically, along with the other apostles, what, what shall we do after they hear this message of calling for national repentance? And Peter's the one who says, you need to repent and be baptized and for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus the Messiah. And then again, in the next chapter, Peter is mentioned with this time John, specifically the apostle, where they go up to the temple at the time of prayer and they find a lame man who's begging. And it's there that Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the lame man gets up and he's healed and he begins to walk and to run around. And the people are astonished. And um, and then Peter gives another sermon uh, about having faith in the name of Jesus, that it's in Jesus' name that this man was healed. And so then Peter and John are taken to the Sanhedrin or should I say they're seized or arrested and put in jail and brought to the Sanhedrin. And they ask them, how did, how was this man healed? By what power, what name did you do this? And again, Peter gives a testimony to Jesus. And they are eventually released by the Sanhedrin because they couldn't figure out what to do with them, how to punish them. And all the people were praising God for what had happened. And then the next chapter, Acts 5, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And they lie to the Holy Spirit um, because they sold their property and they gave only a portion of the money, but they claimed to have brought all of it and put it as a donation to the church then the early fellowship of the followers of Jesus here in Jerusalem. And so this is when Peter pronounces this judgment on Ananias that he's lied to the Holy Spirit and Ananias dies. Then his wife Sapphira comes. She also lies and Peter is there as judge. And again, he pronounces judgment that you've lied You've tested the Holy Spirit, and you are going to die as well. And so she dropped dead. And in all of this, there in Acts 5, it talks about the apostles performing signs and wonders among the people, and men and women are believing. And there's also this curious note that sometimes people miss, that it says there in Acts 5.15, they were so well known to have these supernatural powers accompanying them that it even says when Peter would walk by the people were even seeing that his shadow perhaps could heal the sick and so they they would lay their beds and their mats along the side of the road perhaps Peter's shadow would pass over so there is definitely some significance to Peter and healing here and then as Acts 5 goes on, they are arrested again, the apostles. 
they are arrested by the high priest and all of the chief priest clan, and they're brought again to jail. And who again speaks for the apostles? It's Peter. And what does Peter say? We must obey God and not human beings. And so this time, the Sanhedrin flog Peter and the apostles, but they are released and not, I guess, executed, perhaps, which is what happens later with Stephen. And so that's what we see next is Acts 6 and 7. There's no mention of Peter. These chapters are focused on Stephen and the Hellenistic Jewish followers of Jesus, what are known as the seven. And Stephen ends up being martyred. He ends up being stoned to death. And they're by the Sanhedrin here in Jerusalem. But back in the, or continuing on to the next chapter, Acts 8, talks about a persecution following after the martyrdom of Stephen. And it says this persecution breaks out against the church in Jerusalem, all except the apostles. And of course, Peter is the chief apostle. And we see as the people, the followers of Jesus go out like Philip. Um, he goes into the city of Samaria and he leads people to the Lord. And then the apostles in Jerusalem there in verse 14 decide they need to send Peter and John to Samaria to follow up with what Philip has already done. And so when Peter and John arrive in Samaria, they find these new believers and they pray that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And there is Simon the sorcerer who's in Samaria, who also uh, be, supposedly becomes a follower of Jesus. And but yet he seems to be compromised because he sees the Holy Spirit being given to people when the apostles' hands are laid on them. So that's Peter and John. They're the apostles. And so Peter is the one leading this effort of passing on the Holy Spirit to the newfound believers in Samaria. And so when Simon offers Peter money to have this power of the Holy Spirit, Peter says, this is impossible. This is only from God. It has nothing to do with me. And you better get right, Simon, because um, you're in deep trouble. And so from Samaria, Peter and John return to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. And then the last couple Bible studies in Acts 9 have been about Saul. Saul, who was persecuting the church in Jerusalem and how he travels to Damascus in order to continue his persecution to the north and how Jesus appears to him strikes him down, blinds him with light, and only when he arrives in Damascus, blind for three days, that he receives his sight again through Ananias placing his hands on Saul. And his prayer is specifically that Saul will receive the Holy Spirit. And so if you look at all of these chapters that we've so far gone through, Peter has really been the main character for the vast majority of the stories and specifically in Jerusalem regarding leading the apostles and these healings that are going on and also representing the movement in front of the Sanhedrin, in front of the chief priest. And he's also this judge as well like you see in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and even like in Simon the Sorcerer. And so tonight we continue on already this um, pattern that we've seen in Acts. And so who is Peter? And most of what so far, before you've read Acts, we did the Gospel of Luke, 
and and in the gospels in general matthew mark luke and john who is peter and his hebrew name is known as simon simon peter the combination of those two names is used i think it's like 19 times in the gospels simon coming from simeon or shimon in the hebrew and we all know that Simeon was the second son of Jacob, who kind of has a um, not such a good to look back upon background because he and his brother Levi slaughtered the Shechemites, Shechemites from Shechem uh, because they had um, one of them had raped their sister Dina, and so. That's part of his background. He has a lot of blood on his hand. And specifically, Simon Peter says in John that he's son of John. But in Matthew, it talks about him being son of Jonah. So we can, that's another debate about which one specifically it is. But his second name, Peter, is a Greek word for rock, Petros. And... At that time, Petros was not a common Greek name in those days. Obviously, once Christianity spreads, Peter Petros becomes a very popular name throughout the world. And But at that time, it was not this common name. And so probably his name, Jesus is kind of probably the one who passes this name on to Peter, if you read some of his, um, you read there in Matthew 16, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but Petros is a Greek word, but it seems to have become a loan word into the Hebrew language and a Hebrew name because David Bivens wrote an article that drew some perspective how it was used already in the second century, so about a hundred years or so after the time of the apostle Peter, there is a Jewish sage whose father was named Petros. And so it was being passed on into the local dialect from the Greek. Also, he's called um, Cephas or Kepha Aramaic, which also means rock. So it's obviously related to Petros there in the Greek. And it also, Kepha, was not a common name in antiquity. So the common name for who we call Peter would have been Simon. And, and then he gets this nickname of Rock or Rocky, and it sticks. And that's what we all know him as today, Peter or Petros. So his background, he's a fisherman on the Kinneret Lake, what we know in the New Testament as the Sea of Galilee. His hometown is Bethsaida. That's what it says there in John 1, It's also the hometown, obviously, of his brother, Andrew, and of, um, I believe it's James and John as well. And we know the famous story of how Jesus heals his mother-in-law in Capernaum, his mother-in-law, apparently his wife's family is from Capernaum. Capernaum and Bethsaida are very close to each other, just a few miles apart. They're on the northern part of the lake. And why we really know Peter is because he's just very well known. He's written a lot about, there's many stories in the Gospels. He's the most written about disciple there in the Gospels. And First off, he's always mentioned as the first disciple when there's a list given of the disciples in the Gospels. And specifically, Jesus says in Matthew 16, up at when they're in the region of Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus puts this blessing upon Simon Peter. And he says, where, where Simon says that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus blesses him, and he says, you are Peter, All right? Remember, Peter is Petros, and there's also another word, Petra, 
uh, for like a huge rock or bedrock. And he, Jesus says, playing on this name, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And this phrase going, we see it in rabbinic tradition, whatever you bind and whatever you loose, those are terms related to making judgment. Whatever you decide on is going to be law. And so Jesus, in effect, is choosing Peter as his successor, who will continue on what he has started here on earth. Now, for all of these things that we know Peter as for being this leader type, he is displayed in the Gospels in a sense very on the opposite scale of it, having faults and weaknesses. And I would call them his main faults and his main weaknesses kind of come out of his um, being presumptuous and impetuous. And because he, he seems to react to things and he doesn't really do it in a very wise manner often. And he seems to always say things without thinking before he speaks. And so some of the examples that we find in the gospels of this is when he, Jesus calls him out onto the water and, you know, he starts to walk on the water. That's wild. So Peter's faith right there is on display. And then all of a sudden he loses his faith. He becomes afraid and he sinks into the water. Um, the time that Jesus is talking about, he's got to go to Jerusalem to die. And Peter rebukes him. He doesn't kind of contemplate what Jesus is saying. He just kind of says, no, Lord, that can't happen. And then the time at the, during the transfiguration where Elijah and Moses appear to Jesus. And Peter says, hey, should we build three tabernacles here for you three three shrines in effect and again it's just something that comes to his mind and he just says it for better for worse and then in the last supper that's a chaotic scene with all of the disciples there at passover time and jesus says that you he's going around washing the defeat of his disciples and explaining how you can't be my disciples unless I wash your feet. And so then Peter's like, well, wash my head and wash my hands. Again, missing the point of this idea of being a servant by washing their feet. And then in Gethsemane, where Peter and James and John are with Jesus and they're, Jesus tells them to pray with him and it says they fall asleep, but specifically it talks about Peter falling asleep as well. It focuses on Peter sleeping during this most terrible time for Jesus where he really needs prayers. And, and so Jesus has to wake him up. You know, why'd you fall asleep? And then when the um, authorities come to arrest Jesus in the garden, and it says there in John that, Peter just grabs his sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest who's in this group coming to take Jesus captive. Just kind of, again, he just doesn't really think and he attacks this group of who knows how many were there as if he could fight off 50 guys. And and then he, you know, he, he's been telling Jesus throughout that he's going to always be loyal to him and even to death. And then we see it play out as Jesus was arrested. Three times people come up to Peter and say, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus, one of his disciples? And all three times he denies that he knows Jesus. And so Peter doesn't have a great track record here and leading up to the death of Jesus. And yet, despite all of this, 
these negative traits that we see with Peter's actions after Jesus rises from the dead, Paul specifically points out in 1 Corinthians 15, one of these early letters of Paul, where he says that when Jesus was raised on the third day, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And so we all know Mary Magdalene was actually literally the first person that appears, that Jesus appears to. But out of all the apostles, Paul claims that it was Peter, Cephas, that Jesus appears to. So he again has this place of being at the front of all of the disciples. That out of all of them, out of all these apostles, Jesus appears first to him. And then as we lead up towards the ascension at the end of the Gospel of John, I think it's John 21, Jesus um, has this fish fry with the disciples up on the Sea of Galilee. And he starts talking to Simon Peter and he asks him, do you love me more than these and peter says lord you know that i love you and jesus says feed my lambs and he asked peter three times this same question it's re rephrased a little bit and essentially if you love me the idea is that you are going to take care of these sheep or these lambs um, which is talking about the followers of the church. And it this um, really hurts Peter by the third time because, in effect, it's probably bringing back memories of when he denied Jesus three times and he could not run away from that history where he was not loyal, he was not faithful to Jesus and and yet Jesus is pressing him again and saying, if you love me, you're going to take care of my people. And it ends there with Jesus affirming his future leadership as not just making up for the wrong he had done, not being faithful, but that he also is going towards um, a destiny of suffering and martyrdom as well. And, and so Jesus says to Peter, follow me, even if it leads to death. And so this will be kind of a prophetic word to the future of where Peter goes all the way to follow Jesus. And so summarizing all of what we've seen in Acts so far about Peter, we've seen him as a leader of the apostles. He's a leader of the Jerusalem community, the church that's there in the aftermath of the ascension of Jesus and what's going on um, in Jerusalem. He is a representative, a speaker, a preacher who weaves together Old Testament text um, from the Hebrew scripture, proving and showing how Jesus is the Messiah who was prophesied. We see that at Pentecost. Shavuot, uh, when he speaks in front of the Sanhedrin. And he's also a judge as the leader. And you see that in the, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You see it when he goes to Samaria and confronts Simon the sorcerer with his wrong understanding of the Holy Spirit. We also see Peter as a healer, someone that God uses to bring healing to people like the lame man on the temple mount and he's even known so much as a healer that people are looking towards his shadow as having healing properties and then finally maybe in summarizing all of this is the holy spirit peter is known as a man of the holy spirit when the the holy spirit comes at pentecost he he speaks and and samaria he's the one praying for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. And so Peter now in Acts 9.32 is traveling about the country. He's leaving Jerusalem. 
he's going to visit other believers outside of Jerusalem, and he's going to Lydda. So on our map here, we see Jerusalem there kind of in the center of the country, just west of the Dead Sea. And the circle is around Lydda. And if you look on the right picture, it's more of a um, close-up. Uh, Lydda is approximately 40 kilometers from Jerusalem. And I'm going to call Lydda Lod at this point. And this is Lod is its Hebrew name. And it is located today, Lod. It, well, it used to be the um, known as where the airport was for modern day Israel. And today, Ben Gurion is not too far away as well. The modern Israeli airport, it's very close to Lod. And it's located in the Sharon coastal plain. It has a very long history, the city of Lod. It's first mentioned uh, by the Egyptians uh, in the Canaanite period. It, it was controlled by the Egyptians as well as being a Canaanite city. And then when um, the people of Israel come in with Joshua, there's a history that it's part of the Benjamites. And it was built there as an Israelite town as well. And after the return from Babylon, from the Babylonian exile, it's resettled by Jews, according to Ezra and Nehemiah. And it becomes, from that point on, a Jewish center of scholarship and trade until the Roman conquest after the um, time that we are in now with the early church in Acts. And Peter. And then in the third century, it becomes a Roman colony. And it's probably most well known today, though, in Christian tradition as the home of St. George. You might have heard the story of St. George and the dragon. He was a, a Roman soldier who became a Christian martyr. And according to legend, and it's there's different legends and it's quite complicated, but it was either the home of his mother, somewhere like that. And it was where he is tomb, where he was buried after he was killed by the Roman authorities. But this is more legendary than um, kind of a historical track record here. And this is a load on the Madaba map in modern day Jordan from the 6th century. You might know the Madaba map. It's a Byzantine church um, up above the Dead Sea from the 6th century. And it's most famous for its map of Jerusalem that's often used today when you come and want to see what Jerusalem looked like in the time of the Byzantine church. And on this vast mosaic floor in this church, they have this map of the Holy Land. It's missing some large chunks, but it's got this piece of load here. And Jerusalem is the most well-known piece of it. So Lida or Lod, and this is from the Israeli Institute of Archaeology here. And by the way, Lod today is a, a modern town in Israel. And a lot of its ancient and its antiquities are not well preserved because the modern city is woven into it and so they're the israeli institute of archaeology is trying to raise money to try and um kind of preserve these antiquities but they have here that specifically lod and it's talking about the mishnaic period this is the time after jesus and peter and paul but that there were many well-known rabbis that lived here in Lod. And the most famous, well, maybe not the most famous, but Rambam uh, Gamliel was active in this town. And so you will remember in Acts 5, let's call him Rabbi Gamliel, he is the one who counsels the Sanhedrin not to do anything um, 
drastic to the apostles in Acts 5. He says, if they are from God, then you can't stand against them. And if they're not from God, they will just peter out. They, they'll go away into history like so many other pretenders. And so it's fascinating to think that Gamaliel, perhaps he was in Lod when Peter walks in to visit um, the church there. And, um, and then there's some other well-known rabbis as well that are have were associated with Lod, like Eliezer ben Hyrcanos and Akiba and Joshua and Yehuda. So there was a lot of Jewish teaching uh, scholars going in and out of Lod. Um, definitely after the destruction of the temple. But some of these uh, rabbis are also from before the destruction of the temple. And so there's definitely a history here of teaching. And so that's quite interesting to think that Peter is heading to this hotbed of, of uh, Jewish scholarship and learning. And this is where he will find Aeneas, uh, who is paralyzed. And he's bedridden for eight years and what does he say to him? Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And because of that, everyone who lived in Lod, Lida, and Sharon, the, that coastal plain, they turned to the Lord. It, it was kind of an event that was well attested to. And that, that story of the healing of the paralytic through Peter Reminds us of the story of Jesus when he was up in the Galilee and he also healed a paralyzed man who was brought in a bed and lowered down through a roof. And I won't go into that entire story there, but Jesus says very similar words to him. I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And immediately he stood up in front of them and took what he had been lying on and he went home praising God. Everyone was amazed, and they gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe. So, similar thing going on. Aeneas is healed. He gets up, and, and people are being drawn to God because of that healing. We're also reminded that in Acts 8, when Philip went to Samaria, and he was proclaiming Jesus there, that there were signs being performed. And what were those signs? Um exorcisms spirits were being cast out it says those who were paralyzed or lame were healed like Aeneas was in Lod and because of that there was great joy in that city and so after Lod Peter um well first it says in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha and in Greek her name is Dorcas. And so just to get the background here of Joppa in relation to Lydda, it's just the next stop in the journey on the way to the coast. So it's just, you know, a few more kilometers down the road to Joppa. And what is Joppa, which you could call Jaffa or Yafo in Hebrew? It's it's a seaport. It's right there on the water today in modern Israel. It's been eclipsed by the, the modern city of Tel Aviv with its skyscrapers. But Joppa goes way back as being one of the oldest seaport cities in the world. And it was used by the Canaanites and the Egyptians and the Philistines. There's remnants from all of these periods. Eventually, King David conquers it and Solomon holds it and... It's where he receives a lot of his wood from Lebanon to build the temple. And we also know about the story of Jonah, the prophet, when he runs away from God. And instead of going to Nineveh, he takes a boat to Tarshish there in the Mediterranean. And, and then the, the city of Jaffa it continues on throughout this time period being conquered by different Gentile rulers, whether you're dealing with the Assyrians or Babylonians 
or the Phoenicians or the Greeks. And then eventually it comes under Jewish control with the Hasmoneans in the second century uh, before Jesus. And Herod the Great, the infamous Herod the Great, also controls Jaffa. And But the thing is, is Herod's not impressed with Jaffa because it's an old city at this point. It's 1,500, 1,600 years old. And he decides to build a new port city. And that's going to be Caesarea Maritime to the north. Very famous in the ancient world at that time, or which was the modern world at that point. He builds it and it becomes this jewel, this man-made port. He puts cement under water that uh, solidifies. It, it's quite phenomenal. And Caesarea Maritime eclipses Jaffa as the most important port city there on the coast in the days of Jesus and Paul. And that also will continue in our story at our next Bible study. So Jaffa is has many Jews living there. And when the Romans come to quelch the Jewish revolt right before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, Vespasian comes to Jaffa and he massacres the Jewish rebels and destroys the city. But the city continues on because it's a port city. It's strategically important. And as the days go on after the Romans get rid of any Jewish um, rebels over the years, it's also known as a city that has Jewish scholars um, that are mentioned in the Talmud. This is a, a later period. And it, in tombstones that they've found in this area, they also see that Jews of Jaffa were apparently Hellenistic, uh, a lot of them. And they lived in their different neighborhoods. And so you've got Jews from Alexandria and Cyrene and Cappadocia, which is in Turkey. And so this reminds us back in Acts 6, when the Hellenistic Jews like Stephen and Philip, who are part of the Church of Jerusalem, they also are coming from these parts of, of the diaspora. And so you see those types of Hellenistic Jews living in Jaffa as well. And so it says there in Jaffa, there's a disciple named Tabitha. And in Greek, her name is Dorcas. And so that's interesting because here she has two names, one in Aramaic and one in Greek. And just like uh, Philip has a Greek name there in, as a Hellenistic Jew, perhaps Tabitha is as well living in Jaffa. And it says that she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. And Lida, or Lod, was near Joppa, right? It's Ten miles away. And so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him, and they urged him, please come at once. So Peter is in Lod, Lida. Aeneas has just been healed. And now two men walk in the door, and they say, Please come now to Jaffa because Dorcas or Tabitha has died. So Peter goes, he continues on to the coast and he goes upstairs to the room where her body is laid out. And it says in the room that it looks like the majority of the people that are there are widows and they're all holding up robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made. And Peter sends them all out of the room. He gets on his knees and he prays and he says to be to get up. And she opened her eyes and she sat up. And he takes her by the hand and he helped her to her feet. And then he calls everyone to come in, but it, especially the widows. He Peter wants the widows, the ones who were holding up all of these clothes, to see that she's now alive. And then this becomes known all over Jaffa. And it says, many people believed in the Lord. 
and he stayed in Jaffa for some time with a tanner named Simon. And so we, we think back on the story of Jesus in Nain, there near close to Mount Tabor in the Galilee. And it says he one time was walking through the town and there was a dead person being brought out who was the son of a mother who was a widow. And so remember, there were all these widows that were mourning um, the death of Tabitha. And now this mother who is a widow, she has no husband. She's mourning her only son. And, and Jesus sees her crying. And he says, don't cry. And he touches the, the beer. And he says, get up, young man. And he gets up and starts to talk. And everyone's filled with awe. And they say, a great prophet has appeared among us. God has come to help his people. And so you, again, you have another similar thing going on that we've seen with Aeneas and with Tabitha, that when something supernatural happens, a healing, people recognize this as the hand of God, that God is present among his people and the good news spreads. And it's considered a prophetic event. Why? Because who are some of the most well-known prophets in scripture for healing? None other than Elijah and Elisha. And we think back to the story in 1 Kings 17 where we have this woman and she has a son, an only son, and he dies. And Elijah is brought to her house and she's just devastated. You know, my son's dead. And so Elijah cries out to the Lord and this woman, again, she's a widow. So the widow is an important part of our story tonight with Peter. And the prophet Elijah prays and the boy rises from the dead. And then the woman says, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. And so you see again that the prophet, the word prophet is someone who speaks God's word. And so like Moses talks about in Deuteronomy, how do you know if a prophet is from God? Do his words come true? Does he have this power from the Lord? And so Elijah demonstrates that just as Jesus demonstrated it and just as Peter demonstrated it in Acts 9. Another story in 2 Kings 4 is of the protege of Elijah. His protege is Elisha, and he goes also to the house of a woman who has a son. And um, this boy also rises from the dead. And so these stories have that theme running through them of sons being raised from the dead, connected to mothers or even widows. And our story with uh, Tabitha is she's not a, a son, but she has widows crying for her. In effect, she's like their mother, you could say. But we'll get to her in one second. I want to kind of combine now these two stories, summarize them with Aeneas and Tabitha. Aeneas is in Lod. He's paralyzed. And he's a man. And we really know nothing about him. We don't even know if he's a believer, a follower of the Lord. So I'm going to call him anonymous. But Tabitha, or Dorcas, on the other hand, it's, it's a little different. She's in Jaffa, and more than being paralyzed, she's dead. And instead of a man, she's a female. And interestingly, she's called a disciple. And this term disciple, she's the only female that is explicitly called a disciple in the New Testament. And that is Tabitha, or Dorcas. Is that significant? Perhaps. 
It also says in our story that she was always doing good and helping the poor. How do you help the poor? Well, usually you got to have more money than the poor to help them out. And so she seems to have been wealthy, to have a status and importance in the community. But not only is she well off, she's benevolent with her wealth because she was um, all of these robes and clothing that she was had made for these widows were being shown at her funeral. And so she is a person of significance in the early church there on the coast of Israel. And so Peter, in these nine or ten verses that we've looked at here at the end of Acts 9 tonight, has started a journey from Jerusalem to the coast. And he is walking a prophetic road. He's taking on this prophetic role that we've seen played out in scripture by Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus. And the journey is building as he goes along. First, he's in Lod, and he raises a, a paralyzed man up. He, he says, Jesus heals you. And then he comes to Jaffa, and it's more than just paralyzed, someone who's breathing, but now this person has no breath, Tabitha, and she rises up, but from the dead. And then the story ends tonight with Peter remaining in Jaffa, and he's going to stay with a person also named Simon, but who's a tanner. And the story or this journey of Peter is building, it's crescendoing, but we haven't got to the crescendo yet. That's going to happen in the next chapter as he stays on the coast and what comes next. Um, what's the apex of this journey of his? And it's going to be in Caesarea, Caesarea Maritime, just to the north of Jaffa. So in conclusion tonight, really, we are returning to, to Peter. Peter, the disciple of Jesus, Peter, the apostle of the early church. And he has this whole history in the Gospels of having many faults, being uh, impetuous, being presumptuous. And yet God is going to redeem him and he's going to use him to lead the church in Jerusalem that's going out from there. And one of the ways that we see the Lord using him is through healings, through supernatural healings, that the Holy Spirit is with Peter. And every time people are healed, they come to the Lord. More and more people come to the Lord. And yet Peter always emphasizes that it's not him that they are healed, but it's through the name of Jesus it's through the Holy Spirit that people are saved and they are healed. And this the stories tonight also remind us of Pentecost back in Acts 2 that Peter led, where Peter, the first message that he brings to the people of Jerusalem and the Jews of Jerusalem is he quotes from the prophet Joel, and he talks about how the Lord is going to move on all of his people, the old people um, and the young people, even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And so Peter's life is demonstrating this how the Holy Spirit is being poured out on the people and the signs below on earth are these healings that are going on for both men and women with Aeneas, the man, and Tabitha, the woman. And even more than that, they, on both sides, the church is being led by both male and female. Tabitha, the disciple, um, has a powerful, powerful ministry. And finally, 
um, this final episode in Acts 9 leads us back to the beginning or the theme of what this book, Acts of the Apostles, is all about, where Jesus tells Peter and the apostles how they're going to receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on them. And then they're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, which we've already seen this in some of these first chapters of Acts, and then in all of Judea and Samaria. And so we saw that with Philip and also where Peter went into Samaria to pray for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. And finally, to the ends of the earth and the next town, Caesarea Maritime, to the north that Herod the Great built is at this time the capital of the land and it's it's a supreme seaport and from there um ships trade commerce it goes around the roman empire and this is where we're leading out to this apex in this um kind of prophetic word to peter back in acts one and we'll be looking at that in the next bible study